My name's Gavin Morley. I'm an associate professor in Warwick University Physics Department. And um, my research is all about using quantum defects in diamond for quantum technology and quantum science. We build all of our own experiments and um, we'll be focusing today on this magnetometry work where we're detecting small magnetic fields. And joining us from Warwick today is Ray Zhu, who's got his video on there. Give us a wave, Ray. Ray's a postdoc who's been working on this, this stuff here in Warwick. Also, there's Rajesh Patel, who's um, just turned on his, his video there. And Raj is a PhD student coming to it to the end of his projects. And so Raj and Ray have done a huge amount for um, making all this stuff work. Also, uh, we've got Stuart Graham, a new PhD student just starting on this stuff in Warwick. And Matthew Markham, principal scientist at Element 6. And um, in the background of Matthew's video, you can, Matthew's uh, video feed there, you can see some of those great diamonds. The really amazing high quality quantum grade diamonds that Element 6 are making, uh, the, these diamonds are central to to the great results that we can get with our, our diamond magnetometer. So the plan is that I'll talk you through some of our equipment and give you a demo of a couple of our um, uh, prototype demonstrations of this, this diamond magnetometry technology. And then we'll talk more around uh, how, it all, how it all works. But like I say, do feel free to ask questions in the chat window and uh, we can make this, make this more interactive uh, like that if, if you have questions. So let's go straight into having a look at the equipment. And there's two different demonstrations that we've got for you here today. And each one um, is a paper which we've published recently. So the first one is this equipment here. So this is a sensor head. This is a magnetic sensor head. And normally, of course, we take this to the quantum technology showcase in person in, in Westminster. But here we are in our lab. And this sensor head has a diamond here behind the, um, the green light. The green light is because we're sending in laser light through this optical fiber. And then we detect the red light that comes back from the diamond. We detect that going along the same optical fiber. And this optical fiber can be um, five meters or 10 meters long in our experiments. And that's a great feature. The fiber is a great feature because then just this part is the sensor head and that's very mobile and we can put it onto some object that we're interested in studying. And then, on top of this, we've got this electronics rack here. And this is obviously much bigger, but we need all this kit to have the very high sensitivity that, that we achieve. I mean, I say we need it all, but as you can see, there's some empty space here and some of this equipment we could really make a lot smaller if we want, you know, when, when we want to really commercialize this. And what you have here is a microwave source. So we send microwaves through here to the diamond. And let's have a look at it. Let's have a look at this magnetic sensor in operation. So you can see on the screen, there's this blue line on the laptop screen. Now I'm gonna wave this, um, this tool near the, uh, near the sensor and you see, a, you see a big signal there from the sensor. And if you've come to the quantum technology showcase in Westminster before, we've demonstrated this exact same thing uh, before, except that the new stuff this year is that it's, it's a lot more sensitive and we've got a paper out describing that. So if you look in the chat window, I've posted the link to that paper. It's, uh, it's the top one I posted from Rajesh Patel et al. And that is, this is the most sensitive fiber coupled diamond magnetometer that there is. And it's um, down to 300 
uh, Pika Tesla per root hertz for the specialists. And that's really exciting for applications such as measuring the tiny magnetic fields that come from your heart. So for medical applications, then being able to measure those tiny magnetic fields from your heart is really powerful. And it's called magnetocardiography. And it hasn't, magnetocardiography hasn't taken off yet in, in hospitals, but we think that with this technology, then hopefully we can um, make it work commercially. It's already, magnetocardiography is al already useful um, medically, it's already known to be interesting in hospitals if, if you could develop it in a way that was cost effective enough and didn't require magnetic shielding and so on. So that's one, um, one paper. And then we have a separate experiment, which is, um, which we're only just able to talk about as of yesterday. So we've um, just put up the, this new paper on the archive. This is the second paper um, that I put in the chat window there. It's um, Ray Zhu et al. It's just on, on the archive. And what we're talking about in that paper is this um, thing you can see here. And what we're looking at is steel. And we're seeing that there's a bit of damage in the steel. So what you're seeing here is, here's another, here at the back is another one of these um, magnetic sensor heads of ours. And this plate is a steel plate, which we're scanning around. You can see it scanning around. And in the middle of it here, there's a groove. That's where we've deliberately removed some of the steel. And by scanning around, we can see that there's that damage there. And the value of this is for looking at um, corrosion in steel. So the world, you know, it, has a has a problem with corrosion in steel it costs by some estimates it costs half a trillion dollars a year this problem of steel corroding just that's just because steel is is so useful but finding where the corrosion is is an important problem and we'd like to um, use our magnetometer for that and um, you know you ha have a look at the paper to see more about that um, and one of the advantages that you'll notice for both of these applications is that we don't have magnetic shielding. We're not sort of in some special lab. In fact, we're in a physics lab with loads of crazy magnets through that, uh, through, the, uh, through the next wall, we've got loads of high field magnets which are causing noise for us, but we, we can operate in this environment. So, that's an introduction to the hardware that we have here. And as I mentioned, a key part of the success um, of this hardware for us is, is the diamond material that's, uh, that's available, thanks to Element 6. So now I'm going to pass over to Matthew Markham um, at Element 6, who's going to tell us a bit about that material. Cool. Thank you very much, Gavin, um, for that uh, good introduction to uh, magnetic sensing. Let me just pull up a video and I will basically give you an sort of introduction into sort of basically how we make uh, uh, diamonds at Element 6, uh, specifically how we make the diamonds uh, that we use in the applications Gavin talk, is talking about, as well as our other uh, um, quantum, uh, diamond based quantum uh, technologies. So let me share my screen. Okay, so, okay, so let me give you a very brief introduction to diamond synthesis and uh, how we make the diamonds for um, this uh, application. So, uh, as Gavin said, we, we make, a, make the diamond basically using a method called chemical vapor deposition, and that involves using a chamber uh, like this where is a, basically a, a metal chamber into which we create a plasma. And we do that by having a resonant cavity. So we use a microwave assisted uh, uh, process. We inject microwaves into that chamber that then breaks up 
um, the, the gases which we put into uh, the chamber. And there's two key gases in that process, uh, which is hydrogen and a carbon containing gas. So inside that plasma, this is a cartoon of sort of what's going on. We have our carbon containing gas, such as um, uh, uh, methane. Uh, so the, the carbons there are the, the dark gray and the, the white balls are the hydrogens. And the hydrogen plays a key role in this process by terminating the surface with uh, hydrogen and creating the growth species. And we saw a blue blue ball come in there earlier. That's a, a sort of nitrogen atom. We can add uh, nitrogen into the process, and that then gets incorporated in in the in the diamond. Um, and this is sort of the materials that we then end up uh, producing. So these are sort of examples of single crystal diamond plate. We then treat those diamonds with uh, by firing electrons at them. That creates vacancies, which then we then anneal to form these diamonds are either sort of pink color or purple color, depending on the concentrations of the nitrogen vacancy defects that we put in the material. And then as Gavin said, when you shine a light on these uh, materials, um, you, you basically get this red luminescence coming off. So we shine green light and get this red luminescence coming off. And essentially what we're doing there is actually a room temperature um, quantum experiment. Um, so basically, just by the virtues of the um, MV defect and how it works, you basically end up spin polarizing the electrons associated uh, with those defects and you, you, you do it all at room temperature. So that's a very brief introduction to how we make the diamonds. Um, I guess we'll pass back over to Gavin. Um, I mean, I, I guess one question I guess people might be having is, is um, you know, actually can you tell us a little bit more how, how this system works. So I mentioned the MV defect there, but uh, Gavin, you can, you've got any uh, think on how, how the MV defect uh, works. Yeah, thanks Matthew, that's great. So how the MV defect works, I could show you um, first this uh, ball and stick model of, this is some diamond, this is the carbon lattice of diamond. And this defect is, um, shown here where there's a missing carbon here and it's next to this yellow ball. The yellow ball is, is a nitrogen atom. And so by introducing this particular combination of um, the nitrogen and the vacancy next to each other in the diamond lattice, we get these quantum behaviors. We have the, uh, uh, this, this defect which, which behaves like um, a little molecule. And of course, a molecule has quantum properties, and um, that's what's exciting about this defect for us. And we're interested in, we're, we're, we're working actively with people um, like Element Six, but also Jason Smith and his group in Oxford on doing, on, on building a quantum computer using nitrogen vacancy defects in diamond, um, as well as this magnetometry stuff. And all this is funded by the UK quantum technology hubs, which we're um, you know, really grateful for, and the Royal Society and EPSERP and other, other places too. So let's get back to the magnetometry, which is the subject of um, this, um, this demo. And let's, I'm going to share my screen and show you some uh, more details about how it works. Do please feel free to ask questions in the chat window and um, um, let us know what, what you're interested in. So this um, is a little uh, slideshow about how the diamond magnetometry works. So you can see here this nitrogen vacancy defect in diamond. And if you put loads of these defects into a diamond, you see something like this. This diamond is about a millimeter across. And it's got this lovely pink red color because we're shining in this green light from the right. And there's this red light being emitted by these defects. And so that red light is our signal. That's what we detect. And we can use that to see what the magnetic field is. So but how does that work? 
So let's look at the next slide. So we send in microwaves as well, as I mentioned, this is around three gigahertz. And as we sweep the frequency of these microwaves, then we see a dip here because there's less red light coming off. And this is the source of our, our signal. It's called optically detected magnetic resonance because the microwaves are doing magnetic resonance. You might have heard of that from MRI, magnetic resonance imaging. And so we measure this, this red light, but then this is all, this uh, spectrum that we're seeing here is at zero magnetic field, zero gauss. And if we carry on, then you see that at different magnetic fields, increasing magnetic fields up here, then the spectrum changes. And you can then already start to see how we could use this as a magnetometer. So if you measure a spectrum like this one here, then we know that the magnetic field is nine gauss. So excuse the old fashioned uh, units. We normally we prefer Tesla, of course. But so this is the very basics of how we do magnetometry. We have a load of tricks though. That we um, have increased the sensitivity of our magnetometer by a factor of a million to 10 million over the last few years. And that seems like a big step, but it was actually made up of many small steps where we have introduced many little tricks or, you know, found many little tricks in the literature from other people. And gradually you win a factor of two here and a factor of five there until you've um, made a big, uh, big step forwards. And um, this is how far we've got really so far. This is from this paper I mentioned that's just come out. And this is uh, Raj Patel's PhD work. And in this figure, then you can see the, um, the magnetic sensitivity as a function of frequency. So we're interested in this low frequency DC region around 10 to 100 Hertz. That's the important frequency region. Well, say, say one to 100 Hertz is roughly the important frequency region for magnetocardiography even lower, even, you know, 0 0.1, 0 0.1 hertz is important as well. So we're going to be pushing down into that lower frequency region um, um, in future. And the black is the magnetically sensitive data. And you can see that it's below this one nanotesla um, uh, line that, that would be here. And we're pleased about that. These spikes are real magnetic noise that is in the um, in our lab. You know, this is so this is 50 hertz here. It's 50 hertz magnetic noise and 100 hertz magnetic noise from the mains, which we're just detecting. And so that's that, 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 that's a useful uh, demonstration that we're really seeing mag mag magnetic fields, and we are um, you know we're seeing that because we're not in a shielded room. And then this is a schematic of what we do. We send in green light through this long optical fiber to the diamond, and then we detect the red light coming back, detect that on a photodiode. All this kit is off the shelf kit, and it could be made, um, made you know, much smaller and cheaper and simpler in future. Um, except for, of course, the diamond is, is not an off the shelf thing. It is becoming a commercial thing, thanks to Element 6. Gabby, we just, Gavin, sorry to interrupt you. We yeah, just had a sorry, question, which I th think this slide is relevant to that. It's basically how the temperature and pressure impact the performance of uh, this system. So if you could. Yeah, great question. Temperature and pressure. So um, the pressure is really uh, not an issue, you know, for us, unless you're planning on uh, doing something really peculiar, <laughs> then uh, diamond is incredibly resistant to, uh, you know, changes in the atmospheric pressure and not not going to bother us. As the temperature changes, then that does have an effect um, in principle, but we can easily deal with that. So there are a couple of tricks for dealing with that in, in the literature. Um, for example, the, you know, the temperature drifts are very slow. And so you can um, have a, an experiment where you lock onto the resonance and then the slow drifts you um, get rid of with a feedback loop but you're still sensitive to the fast, the faster things that we care about for, for an application like, like magnetocardiography. 
Does that answer the question? I think so. Let's. Uh, I've, I've got. There's another question I've got from someone. If and let me just. I'll share my screen to answer or help answer uh, this question. Um, so, uh, so someone else was asking. Uh, Dawn was asking. Uh, why is the carbon uh, next to the nitrogen is removed and do you have target that specific carbon? Well, let me answer that by sharing my screen, hopefully. Where's the... ah, I'm just trying to find the application that I need to open. Ah. So just to repeat that question from Dawn, why is the carbon next to the nitrogen removed? And can you target that specific carbon? Okay, so I forgot to show this in the, the first time around, but I'll, I'll, so these are some of the different uh, uh, products that we make. So this is all diamond. So this is a, a polycrystalline diamond, a large piece of uh, polycrystalline diamond. By changing how we grow it, the temperature, the pressure, the, the uh, other material we add into the diamond, uh, 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 sorry, impurities like nitrogen we add into the diamond, you can change the quality and change the form. So this is a, a diamond window. And uh, so these, these are all single crystal diamonds here. And you can see they're also different, slightly different colors. Um, so this diamond on the end here, this is basically a very high purity diamond where we basically have a very, very low defect uh, uh, concentration or a very low nitrogen concentration. This is part per billion or uh, 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 time, times 10 to the 14 uh, per centimeter, atoms per centimeter cube. And so this, this is basically act, acts in a lot of applications as sort of a baseline material. So it's a very clean material. And, what you, and you do get some NB defects that form at, during the growth process. Most applications, you tend to want to add them in where you need them or when you need them, uh, depending on what you're uh, working on. So with this particular material, for instance, we, we have uh, focus. We have we use single MV defects. So what Gavin's talking about, you, we're controlling lots of these MV defects. But by using implantation, you can implant uh, a nitrogen and then the vacancy uh, 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 nitrogen vacancy defect is formed by subsequent annealing because that vacancy then moves around the diamond. And so whilst you don't necessarily have precise uh, sort of, you, you can't target individually what at lattice site, if you like, where it forms, you can sort of implant deterministically where you want to NV defect. For so, for, so for some applications uh, where you're using single defects, um, you sort of do that. In the applications that Gavin's talked about today, this is the sort of these sort of pinks and purple diamonds, and there's some more pink diamonds here. That's why they didn't come out pink on the on the screen. Um, what we're doing there is we're doping the material uniformly, so we put nitrogen into the uh, uh, process throughout the uh, uh, process, the uh, synthesis process, and then we'll generate again uniform uh, uh, concentration of vacancies within that material uh, uh, by electron irradiation. So that basically just knocks out carbons. And then when you heat the diamond up, the uh, uh, vacancies migrate around the um, uh, material and then join up with uh, nitrogens and form this nitrogen vacancy defect and then turn, turning your diamond uh, purple. So this blue one here, actually, bluey green, that's basically after a radiation. So we take this sort of material, you irradiate it, you get this bluey green color. And then if you've got sufficient nitrogen concentration, it'll then turn to a purpley pink color after a, after a, a, a kneeling. Right, thanks, Matthew. And we've got more questions now coming in thick and fast. So yeah. next was from Mark, what is the likely bandwidth of the sensor? So for that, why don't I, um, share screen again and go back to um back to the slides um share the screen again so if we look here then we can have a good idea of the bandwidth of, of our sensors so we're interested in this low frequency region around um DC up to 100 hertz or so, but this is something that we can 
very much configure for different applications. So we can easily um, instead look up to a thousand hertz or two thousand hertz. Going beyond that, then you go to a different um, protocol, but all of our stuff would be relevant still in that case. You go into a pulsed experiment. We're doing a continuous wave experiment. But this uh, bandwidth region is, is what we focused on. So that, uh, I, I guess you can also add to that. So you've got the obviously the frequency domain, but you've also got the, the bandwidth of the, the magnetic center itself. So I think one of the big advantages of Diamond over other systems is that there's a it has a large magnetic field bandwidth. So you basically you are able to operate, as Gavin said earlier, in a sort of you don't have to worry about magnetic shielding compared to some other techniques because Diamond will basically work very well in the Earth's magnetic field and much, much more intense fields uh, um, than, than the Earth's field and still give you that sort of uh, high uh, um, uh, level of sensitivity with that background. Um, so I think one of the big advantages of Diamond. Um, there's another, I think, question related to the size of the, uh, uh, the, 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 size of the system. Um, uh, yeah. No, Gavin, if you, how small can you so make let's look it? at that on, um, yeah, so let's look at that again on the, um, on the equipment in the lab. So the sensor head at the moment is, is this size and there's this stand that we're using to hold it. And then the, the bigger thing, of course, at the moment is this electronics rack. And for example, this is a microwave source but we could shrink that to a chip to, uh, you know, you can buy a, a microwave um, source on a chip that would be a great deal smaller. Here we've got, in here we've got optics. So we've got some free space optics in here. So at the moment that's, um, that's, you know, looking like the limiting thing for our design. But again, we could put all that into a, a bespoke optics package and it would be, would be a lot smaller. Down here we have some electronics boxes. We have a, a, so, but again, you know, this here is a lock-in amplifier from Zurich Instruments, and it's lovely. But for a devoted magnetometer, then we would, um, you know, have have a, a bespoke lock-in amplifier that was was a great deal smaller. So for this sort of concept, I would say that certainly we could do a shoebox size um, magnetometer. Yeah. Other people have targeted smaller smaller ones and demonstrated smaller magnetometers with diamond but um, haven't achieved um, the, this high sensitivity that, that we've achieved because it's really uh, I'd say it, it, it depends on the application you're you're particularly targeting so there's a always with these things you've got a, a swap trade-off that you know what happened with the size weight and power of the system to uh, and so some applications so like the you talked about um, the healthcare applications Generally, there are more static-based systems, so you can, you can live with uh, 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 larger systems. Whereas, obviously, if you, you're thinking of sticking it on a drone-type thing, then obviously you've got to be more uh, uh, compact. Because um, that leads me on to there's someone uh, was asking about uh, Lockheed Martin's dice, uh, dark ice project. So we've uh, Element Six have actually been involved in that um, uh, project and provided the uh, diamond materials um, for that project. Um, and yeah, I mean, uh, so I've, I'm not going to put words in Gavin's mouth here, but it would, the, Gavin's areas has been focusing on on slightly different areas, but in principle, that it's exactly the same technology. Uh, you'd probably do use a slightly different packaging uh, um, for it, but um, in principle, all these things are, are possible. And I suppose whilst I'm mentioning other applications, I will just give you a, a very brief uh overview of some of the different things that you can do uh with diamond if i can find my slides uh not that one sorry I'm on the slide. uh here yeah this one will do uh so um so we're talking here just about specifically about oh it's on the wrong page but never mind uh um, uh, magnetic field sensing, so bulk magnetic field sensing, and so obviously that's obviously where you've got the highest level of sensitivity. But you can also do things such as have layers of NV, uh, uh, thin layers, so like a micron layer of NV and otherwise high purity material, and that allows you to do sense 
sense things uh, with a higher spatial resolution, but not quite the same uh, as magnetic field sensitivity as a bolt magnetometer, or you can even go down to sort of using single defect for nanomagnetometry. Uh, as well as that, there's other stuff such as quantum computing, and, and Gavin mentioned earlier, uh, Jason Smith, and, and, and we, again, we work together on this area, looking at how we can fabricate, fabricate uh, structures where we have single MV defects trapped in a cavity for, for quantum computing. Um, lastly, I think uh, it's worth mentioning just uh, Maser applications. So this is, again, something happening in the UK uh, with Imperial, um, so they've they demonstrated, for example, in 2018, the first room temperature maser using diamond uh, in their application. And it all uses the same basic physics and exactly the same sort of structures that Gavin, Gavin showed. Yeah. And then there's another question now from Adam, who says, yeah, this is a proof of concept. What are the future plans to say eventually spin this out and develop a compact unit? So that's a great question as well. So I'd like to start up a spin-out company. And um, up to now, we've had a lot of success with um, research money, just um, developing this stuff ourselves in-house. And now that we've almost, you know, we've just described this application of the steel scanning actually working and, um, you know, so that, that's just now becoming ready, I think, to spin out. And then the, the medical application would be part of the same spin out. But, you know, we haven't seen a signal from a heart yet. And so we want to we really feel like we can do that with our, um, our existing resources. And then we'd really like to uh, develop a, a compact commercial unit. And I could say a bit more about the um, the steel, in, shall I go back to the slides? Uh, can, can I just uh, add into there, Gavin, just to, in terms of other yeah, sort yeah. of areas? So uh, as Gavin said, we, I mean, element six, we, we obviously provide the diamond. We're interested very much in working with other people to develop this technology. And, you know, people like Gavin that uh, are looking at spinning out these things. That's very much what we do as a company, trying to get the material into these new applications. And th this material behind me, this is a, a part of a, I'm gonna move the right way, a part of a new series of materials we're calling the Diamond NV or DNV series materials. And the idea is really to help enable both academic groups and startups to get hold of the diamond material, the right diamond material to help develop these applications. Uh, and there's, there's so many different things you can do with diamond. We certainly can't do them all, but we're very keen to, to work with partners like Gavin and anyone else that, that's interested. Sorry, Gavin, go, go talk about the uh, 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 steel sensing application. Yeah, yeah, that's great stuff, Matthew, thanks. Just quickly, there's another question now from Keith Oakes, who says, in, in magnetocardiography, where does the magnetic field come from? And the answer, I'm going to step back so you can see my heart. So. What happens is that your heartbeat starts with a little electric current. You know that your heart is, is, um, is electric and there's this little electric current that goes at the beginning of every heartbeat. And of course, there's a magnetic field around, around that current and that's what we detect. It's incredibly tiny, you know, it's around 10 picotesla and so we're just nearly sensitive enough to, uh, to find it, but the existing Equipment that people use is ECG, electrocardiography, and you know that measures the voltages on, on your chest. You've all seen this thing of putting the putting the tabs onto your chest to uh, measure this um, this heart trace, and that's a very successful, useful technology. But it's interesting that magnetocardiography is um, is is known to be a bit better, and that's because the magnetic fields actually get out of your chest better than the electric fields do. And that's because your, you know, our flesh is, is slightly conducting. And so the electric fields get a bit blurred and a bit, um, uh, bit, a, bit a bit distorted as they try and escape from your chest. But our, you know, our bodies are not very magnetic at all. And so the magnetic field from that, that um, heartbeat gets out much, much more cleanly. Um, but yeah, let's do the, um, let's show you some examples of the, um, the steel scanning. 
So this, remember, was the schematic. We send in the green light to the diamond. We detect the red light. We send in those, these microwaves as well to flip the electron spin of this nitrogen vacancy defect. Here's a bias magnetic field. And then we've got a um, lock and amplifier to improve the signal to noise. And then, so one application is putting the hearts next to the diamond. Another one is putting some steel next to it, like I said. And here is a video of our steel scanning working. So earlier you saw this um, picture, this, this video of, of the steel scanning underneath our, our diamond magnetometer here. But with this video, you can clearly sort of see the, the raw data here and the 2D image that, that we build up, which is appearing here. And this recessed part here, this blue part, that's where we've made some damage into the steel. And this is on the same sort of length scale as the corrosion that you get in steel. And so we're excited about um, trying to see if this is useful for um, the steel corrosion industry. We can't see any video. What was that? You can't see the video? No. no. Sorry. Oh, sorry, the video wasn't playing. I could, um, should I try it not in PowerPoint? Tell me. Um, oh, did I share screen? Was I sharing screen? No. Ah, that'll be the problem. Too much, uh, too much back and forth. Sorry, okay, so sharing screen. Um, So this was the video I was trying to show you. So you're scanning, we're scanning this diamond sensor head here um, relative to this steel plate. And here's the raw data. And down here's the 2D image that we're building up. So this blue part is the damage that we've put into the steel to simulate some corrosion. And, um, and one of the big tricks, the really the big trick that made this work. So we already had this, you know, diamond sensor, the world's most sensitive fiber coupled diamond magnetometer, but it really was not working for the steel scanning application. And the trick came from Raj and Ray realizing that if you put this small magnet here, this is a one millimeter magnet, putting it, um, right near to the steel means that we get good spatial resolution. And here's some data showing that. This is imaging this uh, damage here in the steel. This is a different piece of damage in another piece of steel. And we get sort of a one millimeter spatial resolution. So then um, those are these two applications that um, I focused on, the medical and this, um, the steel um, application, you can call it non-destructive testing. But as Matthew said, there are other applications such as this um, magnetic mapping for navigation and finding unexploded steel bombs underwater is, um, is another one. Security here means, you know, that could be looking for people carrying mobile phones because there's a magnetic signal from that. Gavin, uh, we've really got a few minutes left. Oh, this, this is exactly the size I was going to say. Someone's just asked the question. Um, basically, you, we touched on some of the benefits compared to alternative systems. Uh, can you summarize the main benefits? And I think we we'll spent yeah. the last few minutes on this slide, I guess. Great, yeah. So our system has this small sensor head, which is practical for applications. The high dynamic range, Matthew mentioned already. So what that means is that you don't need magnetic shielding. You, we operate in the Earth's field, but we can even go up to very, you know, really rather quite high magnetic fields and still do sensing. Like, you know, we can certainly go up to um, tens of millitesla. Or, you know, people have even gone up to, to 10 tesla, which is uh, not, not so uh, necessary for most applications. So then there's no cryogens. So we're competing with um, squid magnetometers is, is one good magnetometer, but that requires helium cooling. 
We don't have any vacuum, so the diamond is a solid state system. And, you know, there are some systems where, which require some quantum technologies which require a good vacuum, but, but that's convenient not to have to have that. Solid state, you know, is a way to get a good rugged um, technology. And then the vector magnetometry is, is very useful for some purposes. I haven't talked about that, but it's, it's demonstrated in the literature that you can measure the X, Y, Z components of, of the magnetic field. So we're coming to the end, but um, this is a slide to thank um, lots of people that have helped to fund this work and help to collaborate and loads of um, uh, thanks to all those people particularly the quantum technologies hub and the EPSEC, um, you know, initiation of, of all the quantum technology stuff. So we've got about two minutes left, Gavin, I think. I just wonder if we've got any other questions from the crowd before uh, we move on. I suppose one question I've got Gavin, that I was going to is, is obviously you talked about the sensitivity of the device. How how quick how um how sensitive do you think you could make make it? Yeah, so we have you know projections of, of the sensitivity that go all the way down certainly to um, to femtotesla, but you know it's all about the engineering. You know it's all about exactly how you build it and. So yeah, there's, I think there's no fundamental limit to the sensitivity. Yeah, so you can what get. You, it depends how hard, how hard you work. Yeah, so in principle, I think yeah, you can get down to sort of. In theory, you can get down to sort of squid sensitivities. We're obviously a long way off that, and there's a lot of engineering work to make that a, a practical reality. Um, but I think you know that's yeah. the exciting thing uh, about this technology is is that you, you know it has so much potential. Um, and, and you can do things that with other technologies such as squids, you just can't do like this, the, uh, uh, the MEG application. Squids obviously are very sensitive, but then you have this large standoff. You can get the diamond right up to the heart, which really, really provides a benefit. And you, you don't have all the need for cryogenics. So we've got one more question about detection of earthquakes. And I, I just think we should then probably just wrap up with uh, who we are and, uh, and how to contact us. So yeah. uh, what about earthquake detection, Gavin? Any thoughts? Yeah, I honestly never thought of that. Um, sounds interesting. Perhaps, yeah, I, I, I really shouldn't comment because I haven't thought of it and I, haven't, uh, I don't have any, any good <laughs> answers, but it's a great question. So thanks, thanks for the question. So uh, just, I mean, obviously we're more than happy to answer any sort of additional questions that you might have that we can't do in this session. My details, oh, oh, that side, I can't do it. <laughs> uh, and Gavin's details, I think, I think you can get them all from the, uh, um, the hub system. So please feel free to come and ask us any questions uh, if you want to find out more. Um, there's plenty of things out there in this space and plenty of things going on in the UK uh, developing this technology. So we definitely want to, uh, uh, um, yeah, definitely happy to help you point in the right direction, even if we don't know the right answer.